So thank you, Robert. That was a good overall theme. I am now going to go through, so Deloitte this year produced 22 predictions, uh, seven for technology and telecom and eight for media. Um, why 22 rather than 30 last year? Answer, we got so much questions about our predictions last year. We've in fact made all of the predictions in your full package, which I think some of you may have picked up. Uh, each prediction is about 33% longer. Uh, so the total word count is about the same. Um, for uh, what I hope jumps out at you is that some of these are in green and some of these are on blue. For those of you with blue-green color blindness, Deloitte will change its color scheme next year. Um, but the ones in green are the ones I'm going to be talking to this year. So. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, one, two, three, four of the technology ones, the ones in green we're going to talk about. But I'm putting this slide up because if you want to ask questions to me about virtual desktop infrastructures in the Q&A, go ahead. You can see it. It's up here. Uh, media predictions, as you can see, there's three that we're going to be covering there. And then on the telecom side, once again, there's three that we've picked for particular relevance, we think, to Canada, to the Canadian market, to Canadian companies. So lots of, lots of cool stuff that we're going to go through. Just so you know, I'm not going to be going through them necessarily in the order they appeared. I've tried to group these thematically so that they sort of hang together a little more. Oh, by the way, Robert, thank you very much for the uh, reference to coming to Montreal. So I keep, I love doing Montreal. I love Montreal launch for predictions. It's all great. But can we stop doing it on Tuesday? Because not only is, is Pierre de Cochon closed on Monday, but I figure, OK, it's uh, uh, just before the end of February. At least I can come up here to the Musée de Beaux-Arts and, uh, and, and see the, uh, the Waterhouse exhibit. It was closed on Monday, too. So what, does the entire town shut down on Monday? I, uh, I grew up in Montreal. This used to be the exciting place. It was always open in Montreal. Now you close everything on Monday for people from Toronto. So the top 10 for 2010. I think with this, you actually don't need this that much, so this should work. And this way I can pace, which I like doing. So let's start with this one. E-readers. So this is a picture of the uh, Sony e-reader. There's the uh, Amazon Kindle on the right. Uh, we don't have them yet here in Canada, but the uh, Barnes & Noble uh, Nook is the third one. At CES, there were uh, 20, 21 e-readers, new e-readers launched. Uh, so I've got to do the, uh, the hands in the air thing. May I see a show of hands for everybody here who owns a, an e-reader already. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight or so. Out of what, 250 people? Yeah, that's about right. So let's talk about what they are first, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the prediction. E-reader is small. It's portable. It has a specific technology. All the ones so far have a technology called e-ink. E-ink is uh, supposed to replicate the printed page experience. It works without a backlight. Uh, battery life is quite good. You can carry thousands of books if you want on these. Um, they can have touch screens, although that may not be the ultimate solution. Um, you turn pages, you read it just like it's a book, but you can carry a whole bunch of them at once. They cost between three and four hundred dollars. Um, single far runaway leader at this point is the Amazon Kindle. It has roughly 80 percent global market share. Um, about a year ago, they sold probably 500,000 units. It looks like for 2009, it'll be north of 3 million e-readers selling. And it looks like in 2010, it'll be about 5 million e-readers. So who here thinks that's the, to quote somebody, a reporter, are e-readers the breakout technology of 2010? I don't think so. And here's, first of all, compared to what? E-readers have now been around for five and a half years. 22 quarters into their introduction, they're finally selling roughly 5 million units. Um, as you can see there, the uh, iPhone plus iTouch in, what is that, eight quarters got to 57 million units. The netbook in its first year of introduction went to 45 million units at about the same price point as an e-reader. So I want to keep in, in context here the fact that e-readers make wonderful newspaper stories, nice TV stories. They're fun to talk about. They're cool to look at if somebody beside you on the plane has one. But they remain very much a niche product. There are a number of reasons for this. There's all kinds of, of wonderful things about this e-ink technology. But I think the biggest problems relate to uh, the, the slowness of the screen. You can't do it in color. You can't turn pages rapidly, you can't browse the web, you can't watch video. 
Uh, and for $400, the idea that people are going to go out there and buy a standalone device that does only one thing, and even in that, it has challenges, I think is going to be a limiting factor. I think e-readers are interesting, but they are a niche. E-books are not a niche. Hundreds of millions of e-books are being sold. People are reading them on their Blackberries, on their iPhones. People are reading them on their computers. There is a tremendous demand out there for electronic content, uh, for printed content, book and magazine and newspaper in electronic form. But it is, I believe, not going to be, Deloitte believes, not going to be on the e-readers. And I can spend a lot of time, if you want, talking about electrophoretic technology and why it's a transition, uh, but we can get to that in the Q&A. But if people aren't going to be reading their e-books on e-readers, where are they going to be reading them? Now, this is our big, bold prediction for which I have no prop whatsoever. We are calling for this year, in its first year, for tablet computers, expensive tablet computers, expensive tablet computers that don't even exist yet to sell over 10 million units in 2010. We believe this is a compelling form factor for many users. This device, roughly half a kilo, uh, roughly 20 centimeters wide, if you think of it as kind of uh, uh, an, an, an uh, iPod, or iPhone, iTouch, that's about twice as wide and, and twice as long, you've kind of got the idea. Relatively thin, relatively portable. You will not put it in your pocket, you certainly won't talk on it like a phone, but it will be a portable device that fits inside a briefcase, inside a purse, inside a backpack. Weight is good, price will be high, probably 500 to 1,000 bucks, easy, maybe subsidies coming from the carriers, because of course this device is connected. Now you may be saying, but we've had tablet computers for years and they never sell. Last year, tablet computers, the old style, sold fewer than one million units worldwide. Very poor. So why are we expecting, why is Deloitte expecting tablet computers to do well this year? Because they are not a device to sell to doctors to wander around the medical ward and write prescriptions on. These are not business tools, these are media consumption. Portable, wireless, Wi-Fi, cellular, 3G, 4G, WiMAX, connected devices, full motion video, touch screens, some ability to touch type on the screen if you want, but primarily something that allows you, yes, to read books, yes, to watch video, streaming video, probably, hopefully over Wi-Fi, we'll talk about network congestion later, but it is a multimedia consumption device. Studies out there show that even at the $1,000 price point, something like 30% of Americans are willing to buy one of these. It is a new form factor, and it really fits, as we say, between that netbook and smartphone. Can I do just a quick poll here? I gotta change the price a little. Okay, first of all, everybody here knows that the iPhone doesn't cost $199, right? If you go buy an iPhone without a contract, it's like 700 bucks. So let's start with that, that reality. Unsubsidized, work with me on this, who here at let's say 900 Canadian would be interested in this kind of portable multimedia device? Pause. Feels about right. So let's watch this one for the year. We could blow our brains out on this, okay? This one I, I, I worry about. But let me give you one example of where this starts getting really interesting to me. This is a screenshot of uh, a, uh, something that's up on YouTube. Uh, Time Corporation put this out. This is a Sports Illustrated. They do a demo. Go to YouTube and do, uh, and do tablet demo, uh, and it's this, this screen, and you flip it. And it is, you rotate, you look, and here is a picture of a magazine article. And I don't know if, if anybody here has an iPhone. It's okay for reading magazine articles. It's better for newspaper, but reading magazine is tough. It's a different layout. And also, it's kind of not a great screen for, for a really nice, big, colorful image. But if you're reading Sports Illustrated or National Geographic or whatever you want to, imagine flipping through, being able to double tap and watch a little video highlight reel of the player who's mentioned in the story. Uh, being able to click through on the web and instantly pull up their statistics, maybe go into an online uh, lottery or uh, a football pool. The uh, new tablet computers, I think, are going to do an amazing thing to revivify uh, the magazine industry because it is that ability of, of, of high-quality color, I think, is something that the, uh, the existing e-readers, it simply is not a pleasurable experience to look at a... Uh, uh, a news magazine, I mean, okay, maybe The Economist, but uh, aside from, the, uh, uh, you know, because it's pretty text heavy, um, but by and large, I think tablets are going to be a compelling form factor uh, for magazine-style journalism. 